Thanks, you guys, for having me here today. Um, it's definitely great to escape the Northeast right now. And I'm from California, so I still haven't gotten used to winter up there. So today I'm really excited to show you some relatively new data that describe recent climate changes in a region of the world where we don't have much information about past, present, or future climate, and that would be the Horn of Africa. So when I use the term um, the Horn, typically the Horn of Africa refers to these four countries, <coughs> Ethiopia, Eritrea, Djibouti, and Somalia. Today I'm going to be even more specific, and I'm going to cut this in half. We're really going to focus on the eastern half of the Horn of Africa and climate in that particular region. And that might seem excessive, but actually the climatology across this part of Africa is very different from west to east. So we need to be specific about where we're looking. If we take a look at topography in the region, you can kind of get a sense for why. So there's relatively high mountains in Ethiopia. It's the Ethiopian highlands there, around 3,000 meters tall. And what happens is these mountains effectively block any moisture associated with the Congo Basin, which is ultimately coming from the Atlantic, from reaching the other side, right? So the Horn of Africa is essentially in a rain shadow, and it's very, very dry. So whereas precipitation rates approach um, t almost two meters a year in the highlands, we're really down into a semi-arid to arid landscape in the Horn with 200 millimeters of rain or less. So it's a very dry place. Now, even though it's dry, it does still rain. But what we have here is actually two rainy seasons, not just one. Um, what we call the long rains, and that goes from March to May. That's the primary rainy season in the region. And the short rains from September, October, November. And the, short, the short rains are typically, on average, less, but you can see that they're quite variable. So two rainy seasons. Why do we have two rainy seasons? Well, it corresponds to the movement of convergence zones across the region through the year. So just to give you an overview of climatology in this region of Africa, it is complex. Just showing you the annual cycle and precipitation rates here and surface winds. And then I've drawn some schematics of the intertropical convergence zone um, and the Congo air boundary. It's a second convergence zone that is the divide between Atlantic moisture and Indian Ocean moisture. And they meet in the middle of the continent. So in DJF and JJA, in fact, um, you can see that there's, there's essentially no rain in the Horn region. And we've got winds that run parallel as they're associated with the winter and the summer Indian monsoon. They don't bring any moisture. They're divergent. Um, in contrast, during the boreal spring and fall, we've got onshore winds. And they are bringing moisture from the Indian Ocean into the Horn. So that's our two rainy seasons. So um, the Horn of Africa is in the news often enough for reasons that, you know, I guess are a bit um, depressing in some ways. But, and so one of the things it's known for, of course, is piracy. So the piracy in the Gulf of Aden and the Arabian Sea is one reason that we don't have a lot of oceanographic data in this region. We haven't been able to send ships into this region for quite some time. And you can actually see that in the oceanographic data. And for the same reason, we don't have a lot of information on climate. More recently, this region, um, it's sort of in a state of ongoing civil war, and they've seen the rise of militant groups like al-Shabaab, which is an affiliate of al-Qaeda. So suffice to say, um, it's a very difficult place for an average person to live. And it turns out that on top of that, 75% of the working population there is dependent on rain-fed agriculture. So rain-fed agriculture in a region that is pretty arid to start with. And that's the primary means of resistance. Uh, sorry, subsistence in the region. So um, because that's the case, and because there isn't really a functional state, uh, the people are quite sensitive to changes in climate in this region. And we saw that in 2011, there was a very severe drought in Somalia that resulted in 250,000 deaths associated with famine. So the minute the drought hits in the region, um, there's a response. There's very little capability for adaptation. And um, it has repercussions that are obviously um, geopolitical um, as well as humanitarian. So it's important to understand how do the climate dynamics work in this region? You know, what do we know and what do we not know? Now, one thing that we do know is that the drought in 2010-2011 is actually associated with La Nina conditions in the tropical Pacific. So just showing you here a correlation field correlation between the Nino 3-4 index in the tropical Pacific and rain. And I've actually flipped the colors just to demonstrate that 
when um, El Nino 3-4 is negative, in fact, we have reduced rainfall in the Horn of Africa. So it's a positive correlation. So in 2010 and 2011, La Nina State in the tropical Pacific, much less rain. Mostly the short rain season is the one that is affected by this relationship. Conversely, during El Nino years, the region experiences pretty heavy rains and, and potentially even flooding. So we know about this connection between the tropical Pacific and East Africa, but there's something else that made 2011 the worst drought in the last 60 years, and that is the fact that it occurred on top of a rather worrisome decline in the long rain season, the primary rainy season for the region. So we've seen satellite data and other gridded products since the 1980s show this sort of persistent decline in rainfall um, during MAM, and there's quite a bit of uh, discussion in the, in the climate dynamics literature as to whether this decline is, is representing multi-decadal variability in the Indo-Pacific climate system and therefore is just sort of like a natural swing or whether it's associated with global warming. So it's really hard to figure that out when this is all you have. Now we do have observations back here but this is a gridded product and as you might imagine there's very few on the ground observations in the Horn of Africa in the early 20th century. So we really do not know what happened before 1980. So we have no context to really interpret that decline. So this is a clear case where the instrumental data are not enough and we need to go to the paleoclimate archives to figure out how climate has changed in this region and give that decline a context, right? So all of you, I mean many of you here do paleoclimate and so you're familiar with all these different archives that we have and, and the ways that we can record climate change in natural archives tree rings, ice cores, corals. Most of my work focuses on sediment cores. And today what I'm going to show you is some data from some marine sediment cores actually collected from the Gulf of Aden in 2001. And so these cores were collected on one of the last cruises in the region before piracy basically shut down um, oceanographic research. So we're very lucky to have them. Um, they sat unopened for 10 years and we just opened them in 2011 and have been working on them in the last three years and they've been giving us a really unique view of climate actually in the Gulf of Aden, but also over the Horn of Africa itself. Um, and so one of the advantages of these cores is that that's not actually the core, but I'm just showing you a nice multi-core because that's what we have from these regions. And we can actually get really beautiful chronology for the last 400 years or so, capturing the 20th century using lead 10 and radiocarbon. So we have excellent coverage of recent climate change in these marine archives and the sedimentation rates are high enough that we can look and put the recent century into the context of the last few thousand years. Now it's a great place to study terrestrial climate actually because there's quite a lot of organic matter that ends up in the Gulf of Aden coming in um, associated with dust. So in fact during the JJA dry season again we have the winds associated with the Indian monsoon they're bringing dust, this large pulse of dust, out from the Horn into the Gulf of Aden. And so this, what this means is if we look at organic matter in the Gulf that's associated with terrestrial things, and, and I'll show you what, how we're going to do that in a minute, we can learn something about climate over land, even though we're in the ocean. And because most of the dust is coming from the Horn, we're mostly getting this picture. We're not getting much input from, for example, Saudi Arabia. And we also know that on the basis of neodymium isotopes and other indicators that tell us where most of the dust is coming from. So we really are looking at the Horn of Africa. So what I do is I actually use lipids, fats, fossil fats in sediments to look at past climate change and we call those fossils biomarkers. So quick pop quiz, um, what part of your body lasts longest after you die? It's a morbid question but I'm telling you it's relevant so. <laughs> Teeth? Someone said teeth. Any other guesses? What do you say? Hair? That's a good one. So most people say like uh, bones, teeth, and stuff like that, but that's absolutely not true. It's your cholesterol. So far after you are gone and your bones are gone, your fat is still there. And so we find molecules that are basically geomolecules of cholesterol, such as cholestane, in rocks that are literally billions of years old. So even though those rocks have gone through diagenesis, catagenesis, and even metagenesis, we still see geomolecules, fossils, of the original living things. Because of the persistence of fat 
in nature and natural archives, we can use them to infer past environmental and climate conditions. And so um, there's so many applications of these fats, and there's so many different ones. And I obviously am not going to talk to all, talk, speak to all of that today. Um, but just so you know, I mean, they've been used in archaeology, pollution, environment, petroleum studies. And what we're going to do today is talk about the paleo environment, you know, the information we can get out of these fats in that way. But it's a huge field with lots of applications. So um, the first method I'm going to talk about is actually how we can get at temperature changes. So what the first thing we really want to do is give a context to how the temperature has changed in this region, ultimately after aridity, the rainfall, but I think it's useful to have a local record of temperature. We don't actually have very many records of temperature in Africa spanning the last millennium. To do that, we're going to use a method called the TEX-86 paleothermometer. And the TEX-86 is an acronym. It stands for the Tetraether Index of 86 Carbons. It's a bit of a mouthful. Um, and so I'll just go through a little bit about how this works. These are cell membrane lipids. They're produced by marine archaea, Thaumarchaeota. Now, when I was in high school, we didn't even know about archaea. It wasn't even part of our Bio 101, because we only learned about eukaryotes and bacteria. So really, in the last 20 years, we've discovered, I mean, it, they've always been there, but we never really knew that there was a, it's recently separated into its own domain of life, the archaea. So this very primordial domain of life probably evolved very early in Earth history. Um, and we used to think that they were only found in really weird places like the Grand Prismatic Pool or whatever, um, extreme environments, smoker vents. But no, they're everywhere. And in fact, marine archaea are a very important part of the global nitrogen cycle. And they account for about 20% of the picoplankton in the ocean. And we just sort of missed them before. So they're really important organisms. Now, from the perspective of an organic geochemist, what's amazing about them is they make amazing fats, amazing lipids. So cell, their cell membrane lipids are, are very tough. Um, if you just sort of compare to what we've got, this is what we've got in our cells, the classic phospholipid bilayer. Recall your high school biology once again. We have the hydrophobic lipids on the interior and the hydrophilic end parts on the exterior. And it's a sandwich. You can see that there's a gap in the middle, right? So um, that's what eukaryotes do. But the archaea do something totally different, and it's much stronger. So what they've got is a lipid monolayer. So there's no break in the hydrophobic part of the membrane. This is a much stronger <coughs> membrane structure. They've also got ether bonds that divide the hydrophilic part to the hydrophobic part. Very strong. We actually have to use HI acid to break these in the lab. We don't have that. Eukaryotes are just not really built to last like archaea are. And because they are so tough, they persist in the geologic record very well. And so we can find these in sediments. They're very unique, um, easy to analyze. And from the perspective of paleoclimate, these organisms change their lipid structure in response to the temperature of the water. So what we find, and this has been done actually very recently in pure cultures, but for a long time in mesocosms, we find that when you turn up the tank water, these guys start to make lipids the new generations start to make lipids with more and more rings. And so why are they doing that? Adding the ring structure is actually changing the melting point of the cell membrane. It's, it's making it more amenable to the warm water. And it's changing the packing, too. So a little bit looser packing, a little more fluidity. Um, the analogy is, is butter and oil, right? So at room temperature, right, your oil is liquid, but the butter is solid. Why? Because the oil has unsaturations in its structure. So similar to that, you add rings to the structure and you, you're kind of becoming butter, you know. So you want to maintain this liquid crystalline state as a microbe. And this adaptation is not unique. Uh, lots of microbes do this. This is one of the reasons that paleothermometers work so well in the lipid record. It's because a lot of microbes do this. But again, these are charismatic molecules, easy to analyze, so we can take advantage of it. Now, how do we calibrate this um, sort of, you know, cyclization uh, tendency to temperature. Well, we can make an index, and that's what the TEX86 index is, and it's simply, these are what these compounds look like when you analyze them on the HPLC. It's simply the a ratio of sum to the sum of all, and we actually focus on these smaller guys here. So it's a way to quantify the cyclization, and it, by definition it goes from 0 to 1. So um, if we look globally, we can collect uh, sediment core tops from everywhere around the world, and um, and then plot TEX86 versus the overlying SST. And what we find 
is that, yeah, in fact, SST can account for about 80% of the variance in the data set, which is a lot, and it's a primary you know, thing, as we expect, driving the cyclization in the lipids, no question. So we see that relationship. We can use this relationship to form a calibration. You could take a linear line. You could take a nonlinear line to this relationship. We've taken a little more of a sophisticated approach, and I'm not going to go into it in detail. You can read about it. But we actually have a Bayesian and spatially varying regression model for this proxy. The reason for this is because, in fact, there are some regional differences in the text temperature relationship, which may have to do with microbial ecology or some other factors, perhaps. We don't understand them very well, but we can account for those differences by allowing the regression terms to vary spatially, slowly vary spatially. Um, and so, again, there's quite a lot to go into here, but um, in the end, we can account for almost all of the variance in the data when we consider spatial changes in the regression. So this is the regression model that I'll use today. We have an online website where you can try it out on your own data, and you can read the GCA paper for details. So we're just going to jump right into it, and I want to show you the temperature record from the Gulf of Aden. So here it is. We've got two cores, box core covering, again, you saw the age model before, the last 400 years or so. And then we've got an overlapping piston core, which we've got radiocarbon dates on, going back to about 200 AD. In fact, it goes all the way back to the LGM and beyond. So I'm just showing you a zoom in of the last uh, 2,000 years, where we've analyzed this at every centimeter resolution and every half centimeter at the top. So here's our chronology. Um, and now I've calibrated this with base bar. And so there are two error bars here. The darker error bars are analytical precision. So that's how well we can measure these in the lab. The lighter, larger error bar is the one sigma calibration error using base bar. And it's much larger because there is, we're using a global error variant. So we're really being quite conservative in our error estimates here. So when you really translate uh, the data to absolute temperatures, we can't really be sure if it's 27 or 28, but we can have more confidence in the relative changes. That's why I'm showing you two error bars here. So we have the ability to pick up the relative changes with our analytical pre precision, but the absolute numbers, you know, there's more wiggle room. Um, nonetheless, here's the HAT ISST uh, 1980 to 2014 mean. So at least the mean values are approaching um, observed mean values, which is nice to see. Um, and so what do we see? Well, we see, actually, the first millennium, somewhat warmer, OK? And then the second uh, millennium AD, it's actually cooler consistently here. So this is not really of a class. If you're familiar with last millennium <coughs> climate, it's not completely classical temperature history. But then, of course, the warming <coughs> of the last 100 years, 150 years, we see that quite clearly in the TEX-86 data. How reliable do we think the TEX is at recording that? Well, we can, because I'm calibrating this proxy with a global calibration data set, I can compare it to local temperature records, and they will be essentially independent from that. So we can just plot on top of this to take a look, a couple of gridded products. So um, again, keep in mind, we don't actually have observations in the Gulf of Aden. So these are also interpolations. They're also estimates. They're not necessarily the truth. But the good news is we see a similar change in temperature since about 1900, maybe also evidence for warm conditions near 1850. This is different, um, but you know, it's not perfect, but it's pretty darn good for a marine sediment core, I've got to say. So the relative change is right where we need to be, about a little bit less than a degree in the last century. So this gives us confidence that, at least in those long-term relative changes, we're reconstructing the right values. So that's really nice to see. Um, it also has some similarities with the reconstruction of sea surface temperature from corals. So this is from our recently published paper in Paleoceanography. It's a reconstruction of Indian Ocean temperatures for the last 400 years. Um, and we see a similar change from about 1850 to present, similar magnitude. You know, again, different decadal level variability between the observations text and the corals. But in general, we have a lot of similarities. And then, you know, there's some very cool, corals indicate very cool conditions here. That's harder to make out of the noise with text, but, but it does seem like a cool time. So in short, I feel like we have good confidence in the ability of text to record temperatures in this place. Um, I think what's interesting about this particular record, as I mentioned, it's sort of unconventional. Uh, the, most people who work in last millennium think medieval warm period, that was a period with warm conditions about 1,000 years ago in Europe, 
as occurring around here, 1200 or 400 AD. We actually see warmer conditions in that first millennium, which is closer to what we see with um, some of the Arctic reconstructions, actually. So far away, this is a Turing based Arctic reconstruction. And it also has warmer conditions. You know, it doesn't go back farther than this, but from 800 to 1000 AD. So I just thought it was interesting that it looks more like that pattern than, than sort of other typical temperature patterns. All right. So we've got our temperature history. That gives us a baseline of what's happened, which is, you know, to be honest, not a lot until the last warming, right? But that's kind of what we expect to see. So we haven't seen huge changes in SSTs, just little ones. And the recent warming really stands out. So let's move into how we can get at rainfall. That's what we really want to look at. We, again, we want to give that decline that we've seen in the last 30 years some longer context with the paleo record. So to get at that, we're going to use isotopes. We're going to use isotopes measured on leaf waxes. So leaf waxes are exactly what they sound like, waxy parts of the leaves. You see them on your house plants and the plants outside. All plants produce them to protect themselves, to help um, regulate water loss. And these waxes um, are typically long chain hydrocarbons, long chain alkanes, fatty acids, wax esters, and so forth. They get ablated from the leaves by wind and water. Also, of course, when the leaf dies and decays. And so you end up with these waxes soil. And then eventually they make their way to a lake or the ocean. And they can do that on dust. Um, they can do that through rivers. Um, and they're deposited in a core. So we can go in and sample the core, isolate these guys through column chrom chromatography, and then analyze each compound using a gas chromatograph coupled to isotope ratio mass spec, which you guys have a setup like this right here down the hall. So you can do this. Um, this technology was invented in the late 80s at Woods Hole. Well, OK, Indiana, Woods Hole, depends on where John Hayes was at the time. But, but this has um, really opened up a new analytical window for those of us who are interested in looking at climate environment. Because now, rather than measuring bulk isotopes, we, we can say, OK, I'm measuring a terrestrial lipid. I'm measuring an aquatic lipid. And there's lots of ways to use those isotope systems. So today, we're going to focus mostly on hydrogen. Um, why do we want to measure hydrogen? Well, obviously, these hydrocarbons have a lot of hydrogen. So we're really, the only things we can measure typically are hydrogen and carbon. And the, the, it turns out that the, the deuterium content of these leaf waxes ultimately reflects the deuterium content of rainfall on the landscape, the water that the plants use to make the waxes. Now, how you get from A to B, a little bit more complicated. So I'll step you through a couple steps here. This is just a schematic. but. If we start in the tropics, we've got rainfall somewhere around zero per mil, freshly evaporated off the ocean, falls on land. As it's in the soil, maybe there's some enrichment in the heavy isotope as you lose a light isotope to evaporation. 